talked about the ultimate display. And the ultimate display would be a display in which the computer had control over the matter in the room, enter a virtual reality. Uh, so we created a system called BitDrones, which is the world's first real reality programmable matter system. And in the simplest form, BitDrones is flying Lego. I'm Roel Vertigo, I'm a professor at Queen's University. And the best way to predict the future is by inventing it yourself. The Human Media Lab is a laboratory like any other laboratory at a university where we do research. But it's a little different in that we research future interaction design. We design concepts, ways of working with computers that don't exist yet. We think of technology 20 years ahead in the future and think of what users might want to do. One of the developments that's been bothering me is the fact that we spend so much time now looking at a display. So one of the things we're trying to do in the lab is to create what we call real reality interfaces, called programmable matter. And the BitDrones project is very much a part and parcel of that. Programmable matter will allow us to create virtual reality that is actually visible in the real world without a screen altogether. It just lives in the real world. And one of the things that does to you is that you're able to touch it. It would be like a real material. And of course, that's far off, but you know, so was virtual reality in 1965. So bit drones are a representation of what programmable matter will be in the future. This is in its most basic form. We chose cubes initially for the shape of bit drones. Cubes are, cubes are very intuitive, and when I think of cubes, I think stacking. And the cubes are also representative of pixels. Uh, and that's exactly what we're making, is we're making pixels in three dimensions. Bit drones are 3D pixels, otherwise known as voxels. If we look at this picture, we see a voxel-based drawing. And maybe we've got you know, 12 drones there. But then we want to move on to maybe a system with 100 drones, to 1,000 drones, to 10,000, 100,000, a million drones. And I think to get to the kind of system that we see on the right-hand side, we'll probably be using more close to the order of 10 million drones. This is a voxel. This is a single pixel, a three-dimensional pixel that can self-levitate or, in more common parlance, fly. But I don't like to say fly because that's not what it is. It really is a pixel that you can just place somewhere and then it stays there. There's an LED inside. It's an RGB LED. That means we can make it any color we want. And that color gets reflected on this diffuser. The reason the diffuser is not solid is because we need air to move through the diffuser in order for the thing to fly. So it has four props and the four props allow it to stabilize. It has a processor that's capable of measuring that using an accelerometer, and then it has markers, which we use to know where it is in space, and so this is very similar to GPS. The BitDrones technology works by having each drone communicate wirelessly with a coordinator computer. This coordinator computer tracks each drone's movement with a mocap system and coordinates its movement from that. It gives measurements of where the drones are, up to three millimeters accurate, and its orientation at such a rate that it can be processed by the computer and sent to the drone so that it knows what to do, spin up its propellers and go in a certain direction immediately. This is not a drone anymore. This is just a flying piece of Lego. And that is what makes it so special. So what we need to do to get these to be as small as we need them to be is we need to actually design um, drones or copters that are done with nanotechnology where the propellers are very, very, very tiny. And that's a very interesting design problem. But we'll get there. So the ultimate goal of bit drones, not now, not, not within the next 10 years, but maybe even further on, um, is to create truly programmable matter where you can't actually differentiate the individual parts that make it up. So if I make a car of programmable matter, I want to see the car. I don't want to be able to see the individual things that make it up. Very, very important in the future is how can we exert a force? When I touch a drone, can it push back? So for example, one of the things that Ivan Sutherland said is that in the ultimate display, uh, a chair, a synthesized chair, would be good enough to sit on. And right now, mm, I don't think I want to sit on my big drones. 
So you might think that, you know, this is a fairly large object and it might never become small enough to do the kind of things that we see in um, the car design video. But think again, when the first cell phone was introduced in the streets of New York, the actual bulk of the cell phone electronics was carried in a pickup truck. And when the engineer who said, oh, one day we'll all have this in our pocket, was purporting this, he got laughed at. And look at where technology is today. Just as a flat screen is on every mobile device and every, every stationary device in everyone's home now, that's where you might find bid drones instead. So instead of having a TV or a game system or, or anything or a phone, you might have programmable matter. You might reach into your pocket and pull out programmable matter. Your living room might consist entirely of programmable matter. Who knows? The best way to predict the future is by inventing it yourself. And that is how you change the future. And so that's very much our role, is to change the future by designing it, but not by pondering about what that future might be, by actually doing it today with the available materials and methods that we have today. Because the technologies that are going to disrupt 20 years from now are technologies that are designed today. Bitron technology is going to revolutionize the way we deal with virtual models by making them real. I'm Professor Roel Vertigal of Queen's University, and I'm here to disrupt design.